Good morning, everybody. And I know you haven't seen me in a long time because I have been on vacation, as you know. Uh, but I came back out of hiding on my vacation for my friend Reed today because we would like to um, talk a little bit about Prague. And the reason that we're going to be talking a little bit about Czech Republic today is that um, Reed and I are going to be offering a new tour that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, we just added it to the schedule, and that is a Danube River cruise, which we're going to do in 2023, and uh, I will be on that cruise, and it's not really my thing. Cruising is something that's new to me, so uh, Reed talked me into it, and am I going to love it, Reed, or am I going to hate it? I think you're going to love it. it. It's a different kind of travel, for sure. Yeah. So today we're joined by my friend Katka, who um, comes to us live from uh, the Czech Republic. She is a fantastic tour guide, so good morning, Katka. Good morning. Dobrý den to everybody. So Kaka, we've known each other for almost, gosh, it's 20 years, I think. Well, it is. A really long time. We, we were like <laughs> young little pups when we met. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> so how's everything in the Czech Republic these days? Everything is going fine. Finally, we are happy that we have people back. It's a pretty amazing moment, you know, to see everybody coming so the city is alive again, and we are so, so grateful. But in spite of some problems, because here and there, of course, you know how it goes with the luggage around the world for yeah. some people who travel. <laughs> so that even though in spite of this, they did not give up and they are coming. So we are very happy that we have them around and we can again just share what we love. So yeah. how are the and crowds? I'm curious about that because yeah, the crowds, well, they are. Uh, th they are becoming a little bigger, but not really anything what is unbearable or so, you know, so it is definitely not what it was before to, let's say, 19 or 20 or 219, 2020 March, everything stopped. It was uh, quite a shock <laughs> not to see even the locals in the city, but I think it's been everywhere, very similar. So then um, it is actually very pleasing, at least for me, it is a great thing to see the people there and all the different languages again to hear as it, you know, used to be, and even back in the history, like a cosmopolitan feel and all that. So I'm, I'm happy and I'm, I'm sure that it is not just me who is happy to see the life in the town. Yeah, I kind of laugh at myself from 2019 because I was so stressed out in 2019 with all of the people everywhere. It was just too many people everywhere. And now when you see a crowd, you're like, yay! <laughs> yes. hey, Let's I'm see getting... what we will say yeah, later, yeah. maybe. But you know, no, I think that, yeah, definitely in some cities, it was maybe a little too much, you know, in at least some days or so. It depends. But then in Prague, I think we always somehow managed or you always like some somehow alter the tours that you do it in the afternoon, you know, or or simply other ways <clears throat> or, you know, the city, the way that, you know, where you can avoid those big crowds and then you can still make it very pleasant for your visitors. So that's that's fine. And that's why you hire a local guide, because they know. <laughs> <laughs> so Reed, tell us a little bit about this Danube project we've got going on. Okay, so this is a, a river cruise. It's a different kind of, of travel than what you're used to with Sarah or me. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a, I was going to say a slower pace in that, of course, you take your hotel with you, right? You get on the boat, you unpack, you put your clothes in a drawer, you hang them up in the little closet, and you take your hotel with you for the next week. Uh, so that way it's a slower pace, but you do wake up essentially every day in a new city and you've got the one day to explore. And on a, a typical day, it's like a morning of exploration and then in a free afternoon to uh, explore on your own. So um, that's coming up in September of 2023. Um, if you're ready for that kind of travel, meaning, uh, you know, if you've gotten to a point in your life where the more adventurous stuff that Sarah and I are doing is getting to be a little bit too demanding for you. This is a nice alternative, um, not as physically demanding. Um, so September 20th to October 2nd are the dates. The tour begins in Salzburg. Um, at Imprint, we've taken the standard uh, river cruise uh, uh, type of tour, and we've sort of adapted it to our style of travel. Instead of having the cruise that you pay for and then an expensive upgrade to include a visit to Salzburg before and Prague after, we just include everything in the price of the tour. So um, it's it's all inclusive. We've got a great relationship with Lufner Cruises. We've been using them for about six years. Um, they do a great job. They're a small cruise company, so they, they really try harder to um, accommodate you. Uh, fantastic food, 
unlimited wine with with dinner every night. Ooh, uh, okay, I'm sold. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's really a great experience. And as I was saying, so we start in Salzburg. We have a couple days there, and then we have a little sound of music tour and drive up to. Uh, uh, Passau on the border between Germany and Austria, where we board the boat, and then we work our way across all the way to Budapest and back. Vienna, uh, Bratislava, Melk Abbey, Linz, Austria, uh, Budapest, as I said at the far end, and then we we come back to Passau at the end of our week on the boat, and we and Katka meets us with smiling face and a bus, <laughs> and yes. and we head up to Prague for three nights to finish off the tour up there. So that's that's kind of the package. Uh, Katka is our, our, our girl Friday in Prague. She takes such great, uh, care of our groups there. And so I'm, I'm delighted to have her on today to, so we can talk a little bit about that terminal stop on the cruise tour, uh, of Prague. So let's, let's, let's jump enough about the cruise. We can talk about that another time, but, uh, let's, let's get on to Prague. So, uh, back to you, Sarah, and we'll, I'll let you, oh, you well, want geez. me to I am not a good person to ask about Prague because I went there as a backpacker. You know, that was what I did when I was a student. And the reason we kept going to Prague actually in the 90s was because it was too expensive to travel in Germany or France or something like that. And so I always ended up finding myself in Budapest and Prague because it was it was unknown. There was nobody there and it was super cheap. You know, you could eat at the nicest restaurants in town, you know, as a backpacker. So I really enjoyed that. I think it's a little different now, is my guess. It's a little different. Not yeah. that, I mean, yeah, probably. I don't know. Was it like in the 90s? Probably. Yeah, yeah it was mid to late 90s. <laughs> yeah, that's... You were those, yeah, those adventure travelers who wanted to explore this wild east, I guess, if we can call I, it that way. I can jump in on that too. My first time in Prague was in 1997. I spent a whole week there and I, you know, somebody came up to me in the train station and said, do you need a place to stay? And I said, sure. And I, it was like this older woman and her daughter and they had an apartment, they had a spare bedroom and, and that was my room. And there was a little breakfast tray every morning and I'd take it back into my room. It was $10 a night. That's what I remember. And mm -hmm. she spoke almost no English, but she showed me how to work the tram and how to get back and forth and where her place was. And they gave me keys and I stayed there for a week. It was a absolutely fantastic experience. And yeah, you know, food was inexpensive. And I remember going to see live music every night for a six or eight dollars, you know, if I remember the exchange correctly. Uh, yeah, those those were a little bit of the Wild West days. So that was my first introduction, introduction to Prague as well. Same thing, but, same thing. Like you got to the train station and it was always the grandmas that were out there saying, do you want to come and stay with me? I mean, whatever, as much English as they could say. Yeah. And then it was like a little little notebook with pictures the, the, you know. <laughs> yeah so, but it was yeah. really the dice because you never knew where it was and right. you never knew how i mean it was all kind of the same it was you like your grandma's spare bedroom kind of thing but i love that you know and i was i was trying to explain this to my kids the other day because like i want my kids to go backpacking and mm -hmm. i'm like oh it was so much fun back then and they're like mom they don't do that stuff anymore <laughs> well not in very many places but yeah yeah yeah, but 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 Prague is a different place. Uh, so so Katka, why don't you just um, why don't you just t talk about Prague in general, about what the the highlights are for things to see there, um, yeah. and uh, and and as we go along here, maybe I'll ask you about some of the specific things that I know that we will do with you when we're there, and you can comment on those. Yeah. But but give yeah. you know for our viewers today. Give us just an, an overview of why, why somebody who's never been to Prague, why should they come and spend three days there? I think that's exactly what was Sarah saying earlier, you know, that we are still for many people from America, I think pretty bit unknown part of Europe, even though it's been like 30 years after the change. So you yourself, you have been here, right? So then you will also see quite many changes for better, not for worse. And I was also going to say that it does not uh, oh, I want uh, that, that it does not sound the way that if you don't go to stay at uh, a granny's, uh, you know, apartment these days, it is just because it's not offered. It's nothing about safety, <laughs> that it is not safe or so, but only because, of course, a lot of hotels, you know, started. I also started guiding in mid, what was it, 97, actually. So also, you know, before there was no demand and we also did not know English. So that was how it all started, you know, step by step to to roll all this tourist business and of course related services so then with the hotels and so so i think that for a lot of people even though it's been 30 years after the change you know still i think that for many of them we the area of my country my city it's pretty unknown 
and actually a great surprise as many of them have witnessed and ha have uh, said you know that they of course very much and we the same thing we just enjoy so much these days to see the city in shine and its beauty because it has been always here for a long long time thanks god not destroyed in the second world war but in the way how you see the buildings now because of all the restoration what has been going on since this let's say maybe nine, 1990s it's amazing even for me it is so great to see every year you know like new and new restorations done so it looks better and better every year in that way so i think that for a lot of just to speak about our history from the beginning a lot of them have of course some knowledge of uh, good king wenceslas for example the main patron saint of my country so then we you know go to see the place where he is buried and then we just cover this 1200 years of history like nothing <laughs> and then this is how we start the introduction and then of course it's a beautiful thing if you go up to the one of those many hills we have we sometimes say we are like in rome that built on seven hills and once you go to one of those hills and you see the whole city sitting in the valley that's pretty also amazing moment and then of course we'll cover everything important what of course includes this St. Vitus Cathedral inside of the Prague Castle complex for many it is maybe at the beginning when we say that we go to the castle they do expect to have a fairy tale castle you know visiting but because we are in the city it's really a huge complex even in many guidebooks considered to be one of the biggest in Europe and we do cover it nicely easily in a comfortable way for our visitors then we go down to the valley we cross the oldest bridge what celebrated many 650 maybe years plus uh, that Charles bridge we have in the city and then we go to see the famous astronomical clock I'm sure that many of you have heard of that maybe you've seen some videos on on YouTube how those apostles go around every hour there and then we also show you, of course, uh, because it's very important part of our history, the area around the new town, the Wenceslas Square, because basically thanks to that, what was happening, if at least to be mentioned, the Velvet Revolution, I can do what I do, I can speak your language, I can run my own business. And that was that amazing moment for many of us here, what happened in the fall and uh, November, December, fall and winter of 1989. So that's all what we cover also during these tours yeah. and we want to introduce you the town. Well, and it's so interesting, Kaka, that I mean, you are really sort of like a living history in the sense that you lived through all of those things. So, I mean, that's fascinating. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, that's speaking about like you sometimes you feel like a monument that kind of is strange to feel like that. <laughs> but this is true because yeah, I do, of course, remember the days of Velvet Revolution. And I just sometimes say as a joke, but it was actually true that when I was coming to that square with my family, my dad and my brother and mom, uh, it was actually exactly on my birthday and I turned 14 with basically all together what 250,000 people <laughs> on the square because there was just the biggest meeting of the Velvet Revolution happening on that square so it was pretty amazing yeah and for me like if I can compare now as I have two teenage boys and see like how they're grow growing up you know from the very beginning how many things are open for them, the opportunities they have, the world, how it is open, nothing like uh, a, a, an iron curtain, some whatever wall, you know, in between us, I mean, West and East. This is, this is really something what I am so, so much grateful. Of course, nothing is just black and white, but for all the opportunities, what they have, and even we have, that has been an amazing moment and I'm so grateful for. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I mean, this is a little off topic, but I think it's fascinating, like between you and me and our children who you, our kids are basically the same age. Yes. Mm -hmm. Our childhoods were so different, like couldn't be any more different. And, you know, I might have thought of you as being something other because, you know, you were communist or whatever, whereas <laughs> our kids basically are the same. I mean, they probably watch the same YouTube videos is my guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is it. And this is quite a change. Yes, <laughs> that is true. Mm. Yeah. So it's interesting now to see how, like, you know, it's not just that the politics has changed but it's actually people and people have just changed and people are more similar or they're more connected now than they used to be which makes sense but it's surprising to see it in action you know a little bit yeah. so so Reed what are, what are your favorite parts of visiting Prague well uh, gosh there were so many things that Katka touched on that I that I'd love to unpack a little bit more for our viewers to give them a sense of of what they'd experienced but but before we move away from the revolution am, am I Am I remembering right that it was in Prague in the Czech Republic that 
that everybody was out in the square and they all started shaking the their keys. keys. Can, can you just tell that little anecdote and then we'll move on to something else? Yo, yo, yo. I'm sure that many of you probably even watched it, you know, on some of the Western TV stations, if something was broadcasted because of course, you know, again, because of the propaganda, it was <laughs> often uh, jammed and so on. But yes, that, that was the way or kind of a symbol of the revolution was, first of all, the hands, empty hands of people, what you can still see in Prague, we have it on that party street where the demonstrators were stopped by the police showing empty hands that's why it became to be later as a symbol of the revolution of that particular memorial we have there to the 17th of november and at the same time the keys they became to be symbolic like to to, to tell the communists like you know let's say close your door lock your door and go and leave so yeah. then that's what the keys time people were go. rattling the keys in there yeah like go go yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, that, I, I, I love it when we're standing on Wenceslas Square with you or one of your other guides and and sharing that story and you having is essentially participated in that. That's that's just as Sarah was saying, it's like you're living history, you're living part of history for especially for us Americans that that we're far removed from from that sort of thing. So wow. um, and I remember that wall where they uh, is it is it hand prints or is it uh, oh, hand you painted on the wall. I, um, you probably think of the John Lennon on the wall. Uh, no, are you no, no, about no, that? no, no, that's pretty amazing too. But um, <laughs> isn't there a place where there's like hand prints? Um, that would be then the bronze hands. You know, that's the monument to the 17th of November on the yeah. National Street. That's basically it's a small monument just with the date yes. and about the date, uh, like 1711, 89. Yeah. You have from bronze made hands of people, some of them in this V victory sign, yeah. and then some just empty. So that's maybe what you are thinking. Yeah, that, that's definitely yeah. what I'm what I'm remembering. It's such a fantastic day. I mean, it's so eclectic. And, and um, let's talk about the architecture a little bit. Um, when I think of Prague, that's what I think of. I mean, you you talked about it, that, that Prague was never bombed in World War II. So unlike other European cities that have a, a mixture of Gothic, neo-Gothic and classical, and then brand new modern glass skyscrapers sort of mixed in between. In Prague, everything's the way that it, that it developed naturally. And it's, you talk about eclectic. There's, there's every architectural style. You, you'd love it, Sarah. I mean, I, I know you've been there, but I mean, I'm sure that you'll just, I just took pictures of buildings when I'm in Prague. Um, can you give us, give us a little, uh, uh, Architecture 101, uh, Katka, what, na name the six or seven styles that people are going to see. Well, yeah, just yesterday I had a tour of architecture <laughs> with Americans. So I can tell you that I even developed a tour what takes you chronologically. So you can wow. go from the oldest, Romanesque to Gothic, to Renaissance, to Baroque, to Classicist, to Neo Styles, to Art Nouveau, Cubism, and that's pretty amazing that we have in Prague also houses designed in cubist style. It's not just the fine art, right? Like paintings. Then right. of course the modern, like more functionalism in the thirties. And then of course, after the war, and then we can show you uh, if I can say the beauty in <laughs> this way of the communist, uh, the communist times. And we do have names to these styles too, either brutalism, social realism. So it's easily, you can cover at least 10 different styles of architecture in one city. Right. I think. <laughs> and is I've never seen that cubist architecture anywhere except Prague. Is is that the only place that you see that? Is that uniquely? I also did see it, even though then you you and um, in America you have a similar because there are a lot of like ge geometrical style. But in your country, I know that you would call it Art Deco, you know, like that oh. with the geometry designs and so. At uh, least in, in design, maybe not in the structural elements of the building, like okay. we have it in cubist houses. One of the most famous is that Black Madonna house, what is actually even inside of the old town. What's quite okay. unique that you have pretty modern in our way speaking, 1914 means modern um, um, buildings. So that's also inside of the old town, that very building. What is now even the museum of Czech cubism so those of you who are interested, you can first, of course, just explore the, ta uh, the, the, the place, the house inside, inside, because there is also a museum, uh, but also a restaurant, newly opened Black Madonna with two great cakes related to this recent past. The cakes are called the virus and the vaccine. And that's pretty amazing. You can get a big chocolate ball with spikes. That's oh the virus. God. And then to 
cure to heal yourself, you get a, I think it's a cheesecake. I, I got it. So yeah, a cheesecake in a shape of a, of a cube with the red cross and with the injection with vodka in it. Oh. <laughs> so that's pretty amazing how updated, you know, their menu is. <laughs> and wow. when COVID hit, it was one of those first things you could get uh, as takeaway <laughs> from that place. Amazing. Gosh. <laughs> um, all right, so um, when you talked about um, St. Vitus Cathedral and the, the Prague Castle up there, that's a fantastic morning when we go up there. And I'm, I'm going to guess that, that people that might want to jump on board of this, uh, this cruise have probably seen a lot of Gothic cathedrals around Europe, but there are some unique things in St. Vitus. Um, I absolutely love the Alphonse Mucha stained glass. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, of course. This is actually a pretty amazing, uh, I mean, a, 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 like maybe not expected, you know, for the people who enter that they see such big and not stained glass windows at the very moment when they enter, because that part of our cathedral is actually new. New means this 1800s, 1900s, even though from the outside, it looks like one Gothic building from medieval ages. And that's why we have the windows if uh, painted by Mucha or other Czech, uh, Czech painters, but I'm sure that most of you would know Alphonse Mucha uh, or maybe Mucha or Mucha in the way of pronunciation of his last name, but the leading artist of Art Nouveau in my country, and uh, he painted a window, so it's even a paint on glass, a little different technique, you know, than the stained glass would be, but oh. we have also mosaics, and these are also pretty unique, the mosaic window, so we have the pieces of glass glued together in this late 18, early 1900s when they did them, and Mucha painted this window, and I think in 1924, uh, and also at the same time depicting this good King Wenceslas there as a boy, you know, important, let's say, I would say even the beginnings of Christianity in my country, so the important uh, era of the country. So then, and that's unique, very unique. So, and of course his style itself, if I'm sure that you, may, many of you would know him and would know his works maybe more than his name, because I'm sure that many of you had a chance to see at least those posters of Sarah Bernhardt. I, I was gonna say, talk about well the posters, because I think that's what Americans would be familiar with if they're yeah. familiar with Mucha. I, I would because say- I think, yeah, yeah, because <laughs> there is also like uh, often a traveling exhibition of Sarah Bernhardt, the French actress uh, of the turn of the century. He just happened to be the, the, the painter who painted most of the posters, you know, for her place where she played the main role. And then later on, it became to be like a collection of these posters and they do travel around the world uh, and then so I'm sure that they've been in your country too for some time you know usually for a couple of months in each of the cities mm -hmm. and now we have a very interesting exhibition in Prague in relation to these posters and Mucha's works that they I think that they wanted to attract maybe a little bit more of like either younger generation or people who are interested in also other media like multimedia, that they do now have an exhibition where these posters become alive <laughs> in a way. So that's a very interesting yeah, approach to that too. So then if any of you love Art Nouveau, a lot of these beautiful flower vegetable motifs, uh, women, bodies, flowing hair, you know, the draperies, beautiful pastel shades of colors. This is exactly the Mujas. Style. Yeah, I, I, I think what I like about Muka is um, you don't need to know really anything about his art or that period of mm -hmm. art. It's, it's visually pleasant just in, without any explanation, right? You don't have to be an art expert to understand it. And there's a lovely museum of a lot of his work uh, there in Prague. I remember going there on a free afternoon and just loving it. It was just beautiful mm -hmm. paintings. And I'm I'm a bit of a Philistine when it comes to art. So I, I need those visually <laughs> expressive uh, paintings that, that don't need a lot of intellectual uh, brain power. So, <laughs> so you're like, right. It's I very like pleasing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is. It's okay to just yeah. enjoy art read. It doesn't need to be like... <laughs> 
it does need to mean a lot, but but I think that what I like about Muha is that it's it's just something that uh, is very relatable. Yeah. And I think that there are things that people feel familiar with already when they see them, because I think they must have used them in advertising campaigns and things like that, because yeah, I remember them from true. my childhood. That's yeah. what he did in France also. Yeah, like a lot of these biscuit boxes and yeah, in advertising or whatever, I don't know, the, the coasters for drinks, you know, it would, it would be on it. And so, yeah, that, that was true. It was like commercial art that time. Yeah, it's sort of like the earliest commercial art, really, um, mm -hmm. that, that kind of mm -hmm. became popularized like that. So that's something that I think is really interesting about Frog, and that's the thing that connected the most with me is just the arch, uh, Art Nouveau style architecture uh, mm -hmm. that you don't you you see in countries or in different places in Europe. But Prague has some of the most excellent examples. There's also a modern building, though. There's the Frank Gehry building, right? Yeah. That's and what right. do you think yeah. about that one? It's they call it Fred and Ginger, I think, right? Is, is that Fred and Gary? I didn't know that was Gary. It's, yeah. fa it's a fabulous building. Well, it's Gary and Vlado Milonic, uh, if I should be precise. You know, Vlado okay. Milonic was an architect from ex Yugoslavia who came to Prague and who has been living here for a long time. So they cooperated in, in this project. And it was one of the newest, yeah, 1996, I think it was built. So one of the newest, still very interesting style of architecture, this modern, because it has got some meaning, it has got some shapes. And um, I think at the beginning, people needed, some of us, let's put it this way, some Prague citizens needed a little bit more time to get used to it, you know, because once you see all this old historic and all of a sudden this comes there, it's probably not for everybody, but I was also thinking about it when this uh, Black Madonna, that Cubist house was built, because it was built only two years after that famous municipal house that Jewel of Art Nouveau was built. So just two years difference and such a difference in style. Right. It must have been a very similar approach of the local people like, oh, what's this? <laughs> very modern. So now I think that, of course, it's everybody taste, but I do love uh, the building, the dancing house, because it has got not only that meaning, of course, with the female and male dancer. So you have the glass, very like fragile part of it. And even in the shape of a female uh, skirt, you know, so like a female dancer. So that's Ginger and Fred, the solid guy who is holding her. So he is made from concrete, not from glass, like the other part of the building and uh, like has got a hat on his on his hat. So it, uh, it, it was a yeah, great example for or of the modern art in the city, but only that we needed a little more time to, to, to uh, absorb it, some of the people. Yeah, that's also I, because we dislocated, you know, we have all around the beautiful historic buildings again, like that eclectical style turn of the century. And then all of a sudden this modern is there. But very adds, much appreciated by many visitors. Adds yeah, flavor to a city. You know, I think it's nice when cities can can combine modern. And, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would yeah. definitely love to have more of these, and I yeah. hope that our city will be a little more open, as they have been. Of course, you know, some obstacles given to some of these modern architects to yeah. add more. Mm. So I have a I have a little bit different question for you, Kaka, because when I was a, I mean, this was a while ago when I was a student and I was eating in Prague. I just remember it being like everything fried, fried meat. <laughs> it was all fried meat. The food that I had as a student was, let's just say, not not really that impressive. So I'm imagining mm -hmm. the food scene has changed in Prague a little bit. So uh, what are sort of the highlights of food if you're to visit Prague? <laughs> and, and by the way, and dumplings with very, very heavy gravy. That's that's what I remember about the 90s. But but as, oh. you answer the and question. Then you how, can also add that for poor vegetarians, it was just fried cheese or then sweet dishes. But this has changed. Thanks, God. <laughs> so I actually was traveling with a vegetarian in the 90s. Oh. In uh -huh, Eastern yeah. Europe, and it was just like, this oh, more beans. Eventually. Yeah, I yeah, mean, of course, yeah, maybe yeah. our cuisine is not based on vegetables, that's correct, but it does not mean we don't have them and we don't like them, we do, but only, uh, of course, now it is more like salads, you can get now everything, you know, we have salads, but yes, the cuisine, that's probably because of all the history, of course, the past, the peasants, you had to eat hearty food, you know, with salads, you could not really be on the field all day, so I know that sometimes people do call it more like pork potato country, but it's not only that for sure. It's not only that. So yes, meat is uh, all over, different kinds, of course. Pork would be maybe the main one, but you can also have a great beef tender. 
a great chicken, turkey, you know, so whatever kind of poultry fish, if it comes to fish, we don't have a sea, so we have to live with it somehow, but we have do, we do have a good river fish, if it's a pike perch, if it's a carp for many people, maybe a fish they would not like very much, but here we have even special breeding like ponds, if I can call it this way, where you can get a very good quality uh, carp uh, in terms of, of bad fish. Uh, of course, potatoes and cabbage, because this is what we grow in our fields. But then we have a lot of other vegetables, what we like not, not, now to mix. And actually speaking, when Reed said like heavy gravies, <laughs> of course. But then speaking about that, we have alternatives, you know, like more modern, lighter kind of, but still with the tastes. And then our cuisine is kind of mixed with the nearby countries. So it's a little bit what you can find in Austria, in Germany, in Poland, and all this together. And we do very much like it, and I'm sure that you will too. We are not known for that, that is true, but this is experience. Not known for the food, but then a lot of our visitors are actually very pleasantly surprised what they can get here. So I hope that you will be too. <laughs> well, and then of course, the more important question is, uh, I know that you're very famous for beer, but there's also good wine, isn't there? That is true. That's what not many people know. And, you know, I was just recently reading that one of our winemakers from Moravia, that's the southern eastern part of my country, he actually won the world's competition of Chardonnays. So imagine this. Wow. <laughs> so, yes, we only are not known as a winemaking country for one simple reason. We drink it all here. It never gets <laughs> out <laughs> out of the country it's just about well, they say in Slovakia do. too that's why you don't know about <laughs> Slovakian wines yeah 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 but I mean they are of course probably some like private you know winemakers who could and they probably do sell overseas or then abroad but it would be very little number so then it is a great opportunity if you love wine to actually come to my country to try it because you don't have a lot of other options <laughs> than to just come and try here yeah that's right but if but if you're a beer drinker, you've arrived in Nirvana, right? This is this is oh, where that, Pilsner yeah, style that, beer has come from Pilsen, Czechoslovakia, which is not far from you. Uh, you know, you can make a, a, a pilgrimage out there if you need to to have some. Uh, um, oh, I can't say it. What's that original Pilsner beer um, from? Pilsner work well. Pilsner well, well, right? Yeah, that the comes from the well. Republic. Many Americans. That is well, that. yeah. And we even actually do sell hops to your country, so you can have our hops there. I just, yeah, learned from one of my visitors, you know, that he's he was making beer uh, at home, and he said like, oh, I got the hops from the Czech Republic. <laughs> so, but yes, we are pretty. I think this is pretty amazing. Um, statistically speaking, I don't know if, uh, of course, I should be proud on that fact or not, but they say that we are now the biggest beer drinkers in the whole world per capita. So a small nation, we are 10 and a half million about, but we still drink the most beer uh, in terms of like uh, daily. And I think that they say it is something like 300 beers a year. Uh, so if you just kind of think of the numbers, you know, 365 days, and then of course it's per capita. So that's what includes also babies who of course don't drink. And so, so this is pretty, pretty good number, I guess. But so what the, is even more the Czech Republic can really put it away then. That's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. More amazing that we don't have any alcoholism as a big problem. You know, this is it because for us to go for beer, it is first of all actually to go for beer. It is not that you would drink beer at home. You go, it's a socializing thing. You go with your, with your friends. You basically go on the way from work. You know, one, two beers. When it is hot day like today, today it's pretty crazy hot day here. Then you just stop for one, two beers and you go home. So it is about like chatting with your friends, you know, having it from tap, fresh, cold and all that it's not that we would be sitting at home on the sofa and <laughs> sipping beer there it doesn't happen no i cannot imagine being in prague without going to uh is it pivovar am i remembering the name people yeah that's a, yeah, a, 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 yeah. a beer hall right uh, you know mm -hmm. what you call a beer hall in germany or whatever um it's not not the same they're not the big massive high ceiling places but you know big long tables and and really good hearty basic kind of foods you know on served on boards and 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 then a, a, a half a liter of cold beer that's that's kind of lunch in Prague or or, or <laughs> early dinner as well so yeah that's that's right 
So uh, Kaka, what is it that you like to take people to see in Prague that is maybe not what everybody would go and see? I mean, because I know as tour guides, we all have our little tricks and treats and things that are different than um, what the main main tourism body wants to do. What do you like to do that's off the beaten path? Well, you know, uh, of course, uh, it depends if the people have been, then of course we can like go a little more. If not, of course, the highlights have to be always covered. But then I'm very happy if I can take them to the outskirts. I sometimes even take them to, if I don't have big groups, but even big groups can fit into my apartment. So I do take them to areas where we locals live. You know, simply just like, let's take a walk. And I live uh, pretty close by to the bot botanical garden and the zoo garden. So it is little, and where we have the vineyards actually in Prague. So we often do the combination that we stop in this vineyard. We try the local wine there. Then we can go to see a typical, let's say residential area of the city. So then I do take people there and they're very interested also in like the life today, you know, not only how it was in communism, but even how it is now with the transition period, of course. And then like, how, I don't know, how much is things like, how much you pay for rent, you know, how much you earn and, and these type of things and how your health system works and, and things like that. So then this is usually where I can go to any of these outskirts. Sometimes people are interested in seeing those communist uh, blocks of flats. So I do take them there. We do have quite, a, <laughs> quite an example, like the whole part of the city where you can go and you go on the metro. And then, of course, we talk about those days, how it was built and everything. So, yeah, this is, this is where I usually take them. Of course, if it's in the city, then even I very much love to take them just outside of the city, you know, for a half day trip or something to medieval castles if they like, or to the caves we have close by, or to a lot of other uh, interesting sites, yeah, so. Oh, so there's a lot to do. I mean, we're, we're spending three days there um, when we come to visit you next year, but you could spend a week probably, right? It sounds like. Yeah, I am sure that you can, because exactly with, uh, of course, in the city, you can easily do three days to kind of get this feel for the city you know then you will cover all the highlights but we always take you like a little bit through the side streets you know show you smaller places not just not just the tourist places at all even in the town itself in the center and then of course if we have more time we take you to the outskirts and then we can take you to some countryside uh, trips also as there are quite many oh my <laughs> easily yeah. easily one week at least. Wow. Yeah. So are there a lot of expats that still live in Prague? Because I remember that so many of my friends moved there in the early 2000s. That's exactly right. Like mid 90s, I think it started. And I think that in those days, we had about 20,000 Americans living in the city. So it was quite a community. Uh, it maybe has slowered, even though I'm not sure now, but still many and they're coming from other countries too, you know, so it is not just exclusively that it would be or only or mainly Americans. So now it is like many other nationalities, but yet they still do live uh, around and then they do enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, I always find it fascinating the countries that have like huge expat communities. You understand why when you go there, because there's something that maybe appeals specifically to the American <laughs> character in those kinds of places. So yeah, lots of our, our mutual friends have lived there in the past. So yeah. Reed, any other details about the, the Danube thing you want to share? Well, actually, when, when, when we're just talking about, you know, even though you have two full days of sightseeing in Prague and three nights, um, in that the tour ends there, it's the perfect place for anybody who thinks they might want to explore further. You know, I mean, that's, you know, we, we've, our, our model is to let people do their, their own flight booking so that they can come early if they want to have a day or two to get over jet lag and see some things on their own. Same thing on the other end. So I would say, Prague is a place that that really deserves another day or two if anybody wants to to, to layer on to that. Um, uh, but otherwise, um, no, I can't think of anything else that I want to say about the the cruise that we haven't already. Kaka, I, I did. I wanted to ask you. Um, I, I mentioned when I was talking about my first experience in Prague, you know, 15 years ago. Oh no, that's 25 years ago. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, yeah. 1997 anyway um that that the music was such a big part of my experience is is there still a, a big and vibrant music scene like you know does that continue oh, yes of, of course it will never end here i think the music is very very important segment of our lives you know i don't know if you know but we all when we go to elementary school we all have music classes so no matter what if you want or not it's partly the curriculum you know so you have it every week one 
less than one class of music. And I think that this way, maybe we started that, uh, that approach to music very naturally. You know, nobody is forcing you to go, to play, to so. And then, then that's why we have so much of it around because we locals love to go to these places. It's not just for tourists at all. It is for local people too. And then we can go even the way that if you are in a field, uh, let, let's say today I am in a mood of, let's go to, to hear some Mozart and you can. And then tomorrow you can be more in mood of Bach or something like. And because it's so much of going on, it's not free though. It used to be free, many of these concerts, but yeah. still very reasonable prices. And what is actually amazing, I was just talking about this with one of my visitors recently, that like our opera tickets, the most expensive seats would be in your money, maybe something like $70 or something, and you would get the best seats in the opera building. Imagine this. <laughs> so then also the way how it is um, like open for everybody. You know, it is not the, the, the question of money that everybody can afford to go to the opera or to some bigger venue where it can be in that way a little more expensive. Or then you go to the small churches, to little chapels. People play on streets, of course. We have a lot of these who do play on the street, on the bridge, for example. And it's not just classical. It's also jazz music, what is very big here. And a lot of other probably fields, too. But then these two, I would say, are or have been around, you know, for the longest time. And then um, very, very appreciated. So then definitely you will not be short of options <laughs> where to go and what to enjoy in terms of music. Do they do they still do the Blacklight Theater in- uh, Yo, we still have it, yeah. We That's still have it. That's kind of a unique also, thing. I've never seen that anywhere else. Yeah, and we actually have several of these. Uh, uh, and if you go to any of these, then you can have a little bit different experience. But of course, the very oldest, I'm still like the, the most traditional in this way, but very oldest here, it means we speak about 1960s <laughs> when it started. But I mean that most traditional Black Light Theater is of Jiří Sernet, who is also the father of that concept of the Black Light Theater. I don't want to re really reveal the, the magic of it because then then we want you to go and experience. But uh, still the way that at least you can know that you don't need to know the language, that's maybe a good first thing to know because our language is pretty uh, uh, complicated, but it is more like a pantomima expressed by dance, you know? And then of course they somehow play with the lights on the stage that some things can levitate or, or fly over and then that's the magic what I will not tell you exactly how it is done. But then, yeah, very interesting way of kind of this alternative type of a theater. And uh, this uh, Mr. Yuri Sernets, he started with that. And then, of course, some other theaters took maybe more of this dancing part. So it is more like a modern ballet, you know, but of course, playing with the lights on the stage. And so so you can visit any of these black light theaters and you can get little different experience at each one of them, but still with the concept of this black light theater. So, yeah, that's, right. that's unique well, to us. <laughs> you're you're going to have to take me, Kaka. I want to go. Okay. So, so what I want to do when I, when I see really you cool. here is it's I want to do the theater, I want to do the beer hall, I want to, uh -huh. of course, do, we'll do the, the regular stuff like the, the theater <laughs> opera would be really fun, yes. but I, I want to challenge you to take me out for a really good piece of meat, you know, so that'll be yeah. something, yeah, so no my problem, is, okay. no problem at all, <laughs> very good, all right. All right, my friends. Well, it has been absolutely delightful to have you on, Kaka. It's always a pleasure to see you. And I'm so glad to know that you are back to work and you're busy. You're doing walking tours like every day, aren't you? No, yes, yes. I'm so happy. I just can't believe it. And also my friends and so, so. So thank you, everybody, if you are listening over there. Uh, to those of you who are coming and then send over your friends because we are just waiting for you and we are so happy to show you around. Yeah. So if the people watching would like to hire you as, as their own guide, how do they find you? I have a website now, uh, so then it's probably easiest by the website. We kind of grew from this word of mouth, you know, that somebody was here and just sent that information to the friend coming or a family member coming. So now it is through my website. And what is your website? Pragwalker.com, right? Yeah, that is the Pragwalker.com. Pragwalker.com. So Pragwalker.com, yeah. Cool. <laughs> so they can find well, I encourage everything. anybody who is out there who's going to Prague anytime soon to get in touch with our friend Katka. As I said, I've known her almost 20 years, and I can guarantee that she is the best out there. And Prague is such a great city. Who wouldn't want to go? So if you want to go with me, read. I don't know. Are you going to be on the cruise or is it just me? 
Um, that, that, that remains to be seen. I think probably just you right now, but uh, if I can weave my schedule in to put in a couple of appearances, uh, like particularly Prague, I would love to go back to Prague again. <laughs> might, might pop in now and again. Cool. So if you want to travel with us, we're going to go next year in September of uh, 2023. You can find information about that at imprinttours.com. Uh, and I'll probably put something on my website as well, so you can link to that. Uh, so yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait to see you, Kaka. Yes, yes, I'm looking forward to you. It All will right. be soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us this morning. And uh, Reed, do you have more programming coming up this week on the Danube topic? Uh, yeah, we've got uh, uh, my good friend Gerhardt in Vienna. We're going to be, I think, Friday night, fr sorry, Friday morning for us. We'll, we'll have Gerhardt. And then um, tomorrow, we're um, talking to someone in, in uh, Budapest. Tomorrow's Budapest, Friday is Vienna. And since we couldn't get all our programming in this week, maybe we can spill over into next week, but you and I will need to talk about that, so. Cool. All right. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Like I said, I am not traveling until October 1st. Well, I have one little surprise trip that's going to be in September, but we'll be home. And so we're going to go kind of back to old school pandemic days, interviews, you know, getting you guys excited about travel, packing tips and all that. So please join us here. Hopefully uh, every week we'll have something different. So thanks again, everybody. Good to see Thank you, Katka. You. Bye, Bye, Katka. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>